Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to talk about the harbour process, a vitally important industrial process for the production of ammonia. We're going to start by looking at the background of ammonia and, and its usefulness as a chemical on an industrial scale. We're going to look at the harbour process as the chemical reaction that's used to produce ammonia. We're going to look at the two key figures in the development of this process, um, Fritz Harbour and Karl Bosch. We're going to look at the conditions of what was called the Harbour-Bosch process, and also consider this process in terms of its historical background. So firstly, what is ammonia used for? Well, it's an industrially versatile chemical. That is, it's something that we produce in massive um, quantities in today's society because we use it for so many different things. Some of the things that we use it for, um, and the predominantly we're thinking about fertilisers like ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulphate or urea um, for agriculture. We're thinking about it as, as a precursor for the production of nitric acid, which is also then used to produce a range of things. Um, it's used in the production of explosives, which is um, vitally important. It's also then in other more everyday things like household cleaners and detergents. We use it in the production of fibres like um, uh, acrylics and nylon and rayon, and also as a greener alternative for a refrigerant gas in things like air conditioners and refrigerators and freezers. So let's look at the harbour process. The harbour process is a reaction to produce ammonia from its constituent elements, that is nitrogen and hydrogen gases. Okay, this is the, the chemical equation for what we see. We've got a 1 to 3 ratio of the products producing 2 moles worth of ammonia, and it has a delta H value of minus 92 kilojoules per mole, so it's an exothermic process. Okay, but one thing to, to notice from the, the way it's written here is that it is an equilibrium reaction. Okay, that does gonna, is going to have massive impact on the way that we use the harbour process to produce ammonia. But we'll discuss that a bit further a bit later on. Um, and so for this equilibrium process at 300 degrees Celsius, that you can see its KEQ value is 4.34 times 10, times 10 to the minus 3. So the equilibrium still lies significantly to the left-hand side here, um, even at an elevated temperature such as this. So, let's have a quick look at Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch. So Fritz Haber was the one who first developed the original process for the production of ammonia, starting in 1905. Okay, so he developed a way to actually combine these reactions together on a small scale at very high temperatures, around about 1000 degrees Celsius, um, and then kind of started integrating the role of, of um, catalysts, like iron, in order to actually try and um, facilitate the process. But it was still relatively small scale and managed to get it to produce about 100 grams of ammonia kind of after some time of actually developing it. But obviously at an industrial level that's not practical. You need to produce tons and tons of this. And so Carl Bosch, who was a talented industrial chemist, um, actually took this and then scaled, worked out a way to scale up the production in 1913. Um, so in order to actually kind of make it larger, make it more efficient, make it more effective, and so really refined the process, being able to actually um, change up the sort of catalyst that's, that's used, being able to work out a way to massively increase yield by recycling the reactant gases that were unused um, to, to really boost the production. So some of the conditions that this process would use were the, you know, kind of if we were setting it up as a plant, um, you know, so around about 15 to 20 megapascals of pressure. So that's around about um, 200 times atmospheric pressure. Um, give or take. Um, at a temperature we typically use about 500 degrees Celsius, so significantly elevated. We'll talk about the role of pressure and temperature in terms of the yield and rate um, in another video. We use an iron-based or magnetite catalyst as a way to actually facilitate the process. And then in terms of where we actually get our reactants from, firstly nitrogen is, is freely available in the atmosphere, so we extract it from the air, whereas the hydrogen in order to get as a pure element that we have to use chemical processes involving natural gas, or that is the methane in natural gas. So we take the natural gas and we do it in it, and it's called the steam reforming process. So actually using um, steam, to the, and then we produce carbon monoxide and then three moles of hydrogen gas. But the carbon monoxide will poison the catalyst if we continue this. So what we have to do is a subsequent reaction with steam to actually convert the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. And in doing so, we also produce additional hydrogen gas. So we've got two readily available sources of the reactants that we need. We've got some, some reaction conditions that we can use in order to get this process to work effectively. 
But one thing that we really need to consider here is the historical background of this process. Okay, so if you think about the, the time frame that I was talking about, that Harbour, Fritz Harbour developed it in 1905, Bosch is kind of working out a way to scale it up in 1913. So in terms of historical background, we're thinking about prior, just prior to World War I. Okay, and so one of the things that, that had been developed was that they had worked out ways to create artificial fertilisers rather than just relying on manure and things like that. Artificial fertilisers using nitric acid. But in order actually to actually produce nitric acid, they needed to use naturally occurring nitrate compounds. Now Germany doesn't contain any deposits of nitrate compounds as a natural kind of mineral resource that they would have access to. They would import it from South America or like in Chile or Argentina. But one of the things that happened is that as we were leading up to World War I, that these naturally occurring supplies were blockaded by Britain so that German ships couldn't actually bring these supplies back to Germany and so these supplies were cut off. So the traditional process that Germany had been using to actually manufacture uh, fertilizers and also then to manufacture explosives um, was now effectively stopped because of this blockade by the British Navy. And so then actually developing the harbour process, being able to produce ammonia and then get this, this process going um, ho at home rather than relying on imported goods meant that Germany was able to manufacture fertilisers and explosives, which you can imagine that both of those two things had significant impacts on the outcome of World War I. That if Germany hadn't been able to produce explosives, that then its, its ability to restock or rearm its armed forces would have been severely limited. And its ability to feed that immense army that it would be using um, through the use of fertilisers would be greatly um, diminished. So having access to this meant that Germany's efforts in World War I were greatly increased and prolonged. Um, so you, you could, you know, think about this in terms of that context, that saying that, all right, well, yes, that the harbour process has developed a, and a wonderful um, ability to develop artificial fertilisers, and in terms of agriculture today, it's made massive positive gains. But in terms of the impact at that time, um, and further things that Fritz Haber did as, as a German chemist and to support Germany's efforts in World War I in terms of chemical weapons and things like that mean that, that some of the things that happened here, you know, were not a very positive outcome. Or, you know, there were a lot of negative consequences that, that, um, that came about as a result. So we looked at the role of ammonia in terms of its relevance in industry and applications in industry. We looked at the harbour process, the kind of the chemistry behind how ammonia can be made. We looked at Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch as the two kind of key figures um, involved in the development of this process, first at a small scale and then at an industrial scale. We looked at some of the conditions in that harbour Bosch process at that industrial level. And we looked at it in terms of the historical background of the development of this process. Alright, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to, hit, to like and subscribe. Bye for now.